Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's time for the webinar to start now, so we'll give it one more minute and just give everybody the chance to join. So I'll be back in a minute. Oh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, there's a lot of people joining us from across the world today, so that's fantastic. Welcome to the second webinar um, that we are running. It it's, will be a series of many. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so you will receive an on-demand link um, for this webinar after the event. Um, now, just to let you know that the webinar link um, might be a little bit delayed because of um, Cisco dealing with all the, the on-demand links that they have to produce. So just bear with us, but you definitely will receive the on-demand link. Um, just please note to make sure that you are on mute uh, to give our presenters a chance um, and everybody can hear in clearly. So I'm Cornell Roberts, uh, the Marketing Manager for YIC Technology, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, I would like to introduce to you Professor Arturo Mediano, um, who's from the HF Magic Lab at the University of Zaragoza, and he's YIC's collaborator, and he will be leading today's presentation. Um, Professor Arturo is the founder of the HF Magic Lab, which is a specialized laboratory for design, diagnostic, and troubleshooting of the EMC and EMI fields. If you have any questions during this webinar, please use the chat function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we will aim to answer each question um, after Professor Arturo's uh, presentation. So many thanks for participating in this webinar. Enjoy it, and uh, I'll hand over to Professor Arturo now. now. Thank you very much. Bye. Hello, everybody. So thank you, Cornell, for your nice presentation. And welcome to everybody to this uh, webinar about uh, knee field um, scanners and knee field tools. What I am going to try is to review in a little more than one hour some of the ideas related with how to make debugging of the electronic circuits with, uh, in the near field. Eh? And we are interested especially uh, finding where we have a specific area that is uh, aggressive and, for example, is creating failures in radiated emissions. Okay, to make the presentation, I'm going to share my screen. So let's uh, open my screen here, and I hope you will be able to see it in a moment. Okay, so if there is no problem, now you have in your screen uh, the main, uh, the first slide of my presentation. This is what we are going to do is EMI, EMC design and troubleshooting using near field probes and scanners. As Cornell was uh, explaining, my name is Arturo Mediano and I am from Spain. So first, let me give you a big uh, whiz related with the solution of the coronavirus in your country, in my country and in the world in general. Well, this seminar is organized by uh, YIC Technologies, it's a company uh, that is collaborating with me from some time ago, and uh, is the company that uh, is uh, uh, presenting the, the scanners that we'll be using in my, in my demos. Like on Airworks explained, my laboratory is called the HF Magic Lab. We are in Spain, in Zaragoza, and we are specialized in solving and analyzing problems related with high frequency 
uh, like, for example, EMI, EMC, signal integrity. And because this topic is not very easy for some companies, especially companies working in low frequencies, uh, not familiar with antennas, with wireless communications, or with radio frequency in general, uh, that is because the, the name of the laboratory is the, the Magic Lab. Well, let's start with the outline for the session. Uh, the first part of the, uh, of the uh, seminar will be related with the theory, uh, not uh, with equations, only the fundamentals for need field analysis. Then we will have some demos. Let me show you the, the setup. So this is the setup I will be using in my demos. You can see here the instruments I will be using, the scope, the power supply. I will be using the uh, flat scanner. This scanner has uh, around 1,200 1, small near-field probes for measuring especially PCB circuits, and I will be using the EM probe that is a scanner that is using only one probe that is uh, running around some specific circuit to find uh, aggressive uh, areas like this. This is the, for the second part of the seminar. So in the first part, I will be uh, trying to explain these ideas, basically what is the EMI and EMC culprits and victims. Uh, we will be presenting uh, ideas for, like, for example, what is electric and magnetic field and wave impedance. We will be talking about near and far fields. And uh, when we have clear this area, we will be able to go to the demos, where I will be doing some demos with near field probes, handy near field probes, with the scanners. And uh, I will be uh, doing experiments uh, to demonstrate what is the spectral scan, the spatial scan, and many other uh, features of these kind of tools. No? At the end, we have the conclusions and the time for questions. You can ask uh, what you want. If I am able to answer, I will be glad to do this. And if I don't know to do that, uh, I will try to give you the opportunity to receive the response later by email. Well, this is the first uh, slide to, ex to introduce the idea. No? You, we are worried about EMI. What is uh, EMI or EMC? It's a problem uh, for many, many electronic uh, manufacturers uh, that uh, experiment this problem. The idea of uh, that some kind of transmitter of electromagnetic energy send the signal to some kind of victim. Usually the victims are circuits working with very small voltages, currents, or in general signals. That is because typically a good uh, EMI uh, receiver is a radio or a TV receiver. But uh, really any kind of electronic product can fail with electromagnetic energy, medical products, home appliances, audio systems. And basically the transmitter can be some kind of intentional transmitter, for example, a telephone, a walkie-talkie, or some kind of ra radio or TV transmitter, or for example, can be some kind of unintentional transmitter. I mean, for example, the power supply of your computer, the, uh, the, the motor that you have in some kind of a home appliance in, at your home, any kind of electronic circuit today can create these kind of problems. These problems have three important uh, parameters to control. One parameter is the distance. When you have a short distance between the culprit and the victim, you have more probabilities to have problems. Another important parameter is the frequency. Typically, we will find more problems if we work at higher frequencies. Obviously, you can find problems at 50 or 60 hertz, especially magnetic field problems many times. But if you increase the frequency of your system, probably you will be more aggressive and you will be more sensitive to the environment. And finally, power. Systems with big signals in amplitude or with small signals in amplitude are more uh, typically um, uh, uh, aggressors or uh, victims for this kind of effects. Well, in EMI and EMC, we consider two different problems. We call about, uh, we talk about emission problems, or we talk about immunity or susceptibility problems. When we have emission problems, that means that your product, an electronic circuit, is uh, creating radiated emissions. I mean, electromagnetic energy goes to the air and is able to arrive at some distance in the, to another electronic circuit, or you can inject the uh, signal, this uh, EMI can be injected in the power supply core, in the power supply system, no? For example, the 120 volts, 60 hertz, if you are powering from the mains, or for example, the DC voltage, if you are powering the system in an automotive application. It, in the opposite uh, um, point of view, when you are interested in immunity, the idea is that your product can receive energy through the power supply cable 
And then this power supply cable can carry energy that can create a failure in your product, or you can receive the energy through the air, and this is what we call radiated EMI in immunity point of view. Both emissions and immunity are limited by regulations. You cannot sell a product without comply this kind of um, uh, regulatory uh, limits. That is because it's familiar for you, I am sure. Our Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think we we still see your lab in the background. Uh, are you sharing something on the other screen? Yes, I was. I am sharing the 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 slides. Sorry. Let me see what happened. No, so we don't see that. Okay. Let me see why this happens. Okay. Let me see. Um, All we see is is the the lab actually. Yeah, I understand. Let me try now. Uh, what can where is the screen of okay now we can see the slide as well you see the slide now yes oh but this is not the screen i am sorry <laughs> okay that i don't know why okay sorry let's say uh, let's go you see now the screen the the slide yeah i can see the slide yeah. okay okay sorry let's go to the back. This is the slide I was explaining before. No? When you have a problem of EMI and EMC, uh, the idea is that you have two different problems, emissions, or you can have immunity and susceptibility problems. I was explaining that your product can inject noise in the environment through the air. This is what we call radiated emissions, or we can inject the noise in the power supply cord uh, in this direction. So this is what we call conducted emissions. If we are interested in immunity or susceptibility, the idea is that the noise is received through the air or is received through the power supply cord. Now, both problems are limited by regulations. So let me see what happens if you are interested, for example, in a problem related with emissions. No? This is a typical plot, this is a typical result where you are failing in radiated emissions. In yellow color, you can see the electric field, you have some distance, typically three meters, and in red color, you have the limit of regulations. You can see that in this example, for ex you, in this example, in this area, in these frequencies here, this area here, we are failing at uh, close to uh, 10 dB over the limit. This is a response that is um, in some kind of mountain, is a, what we call a broadband emission, broadband emission, because the energy is in, below this mountain, and because of the resolution bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer or the EMI receiver we are using, we are not able to identify specifically at what frequencies below this mountain we have the emissions. This is fully different to a narrow band emissions, narrow band emission, like this one. This is the typical result from the emissions when you have a clock that is creating radiated emissions, uh, for example, with the harmonics of uh, 20, 30, 50 megahertz clock. No, You can identify clearly with these lines at what frequencies you have energy, at, at what frequencies you don't have energy. One of the main uh, problems that the designer has is to find where and is created this energy, and basically, where is the path of this energy from the source to the victim? And the, where here is where the near field probes can be useful uh, scanning uh, your prototypes or your uh, designs in the test uh, session. Well, let's uh, explain uh, some idea in a non very uh, formal or academic point of view uh, related with what is uh, the point of view you have to analyze a circuit. For example, you can consider to analyze the circuit in the circuit theory point of view. This is what we call Kirchhoff. No? So if you have this electronic circuit, you start to consider that you have voltages between different points in your circuit, and you have currents, and these currents are going through the traces. So many people, when designing a circuit, this component and this component, and they are connected to ground, connected to ground, this is the connection. They uh, plot things like, for example, this voltage, and they plot the current like something that is going uh, inside of this wire, inside of this trace. No? But the idea is that with this point of view, we are not able to understand many of our EMI problems. Obviously, it's a point of view that is very useful, because if you multiply voltage and current, you have power. Or if you calculate the ratio between the voltage and current, you have impedance. So typically, when you, we are designing circuits, we work with voltage and current 
or we work with power and impedance. It depends on what is more practical for my specific application. But sometimes we need to analyze the circuit from the electromagnetic point of view. That means Maxwell theory. No? So for example, consider that the electric field is something that I draw in red color. Electric field in my circuit is something like this around the components, around the traces. Remember, in electromagnetic theory, the energy is not inside of the wire, inside of the traces, around the components. That is because you can plot clearly this electric field like some kind of fog around your circuit. And if we plot in green color, for example, where is the a magnetic field, something like this, is something similar. We have magnetic field, and this magnetic field is like fog around my components. We have two different circuits in our designs. Perhaps we have circuits with high impedance, or perhaps we have circuits with high, uh, with low impedance. So in electromagnetic theory, we can do a similar calculation to the circuit theory. We can multiply electric and magnetic fields so we obtain the pointing vector. This is related with the energy of the signal. And we can calculate the ratio. This is the units of electric field and magnetic field, this ratio, are ohms. So this is what we call wave impedance. Typically, we try to consider that electric field are related with voltage in the other point of view, and magnetic field is related with current in the other point of view. So you have a system with a high impedance. That means you have more voltage than current. So this is equivalent to have a high impedance uh, circuit in electromagnetic theory. That means high impedance is a high electric field and low magnetic field. And the opposite if you try to think in, um, in a low impedance point of view. Well, where is this energy? Remember, this energy is around the component. It's around the conductors. The, it, this energy is not far from the circuit. But you have the possibility to experiment this effect. A part of this energy, perhaps a small part of this energy, is able to go away. This is what we call radiation. This radiation, this radiated energy, needs some specific element in your system. You need to have in your system some kind of antenna. So for example, if you are designing a wireless system, you will prepare some small PCB trays or some small wire to be able to radiate 2.4 gigahertz, because this is a signal that you want to radiate or to pick up from the environment. But when you are designing an electronic circuit, you can create a lot of unintentional antennas. And if these unintentional antennas are excited with the harmonics of your clock, with the harmonics of your signals, with the frequencies that are involved in your design, you will be able to have energy at some specific distance. This specific distance is what we call the far field. So it's very important to uh, make a difference between the far field, what we can consider that is here, and the near field, that is something that is close to the circuit. The close or the far concept is related with the frequency of the signal. And this is what we can plot here. You know? We are going to plot how much is the wave impedance. Remember, wave impedance here, the wave impedance is the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field. And consider that this is the circuit that is creating the signal that is being radiated at some distance. When you are far from the system, when you are, for example, here at this point, you are here, OK, you receive something that in circuit theory, uh, sorry, in electromagnetic theory uh, books uh, is explained like a plane wave. So in these books, they explain that you are receiving electric and magnetic fields that are perpendicular. No, this is what in these books is explained like a plane wave. So if you are at this distance and you measure electric field and you measure magnetic field and you calculate the ratio, this ratio is basically related with the ratio between the permeability and the permittivity of the air, of the media. It's not dependent of the nature of the circuit that created the signal. It's only a property of the media. And if you calculate this ratio, 
you will see that this ratio is exactly 377 ohms. This is 377 ohms. So what happened at this point? At this point, you have a wave impedance that is 377 ohms. If you go to this point and you make the same calculation, you will see that the value is exactly the same. At this point, the ratio is exactly the same value. So in this area, the wave impedance is exactly 377 ohms, because if you go away from the circuit, if you go in this direction, electric and magnetic field are attenuated in the same proportion. So the ratio is constant, is this 377 ohm. And remember, this ratio is independent of what kind of circuit was creating the signal. We have, for example, in the limit, two different circuits that, that can create these signals. Consider circuits with a low impedance or circuits with a high impedance. What is a circuit with low impedance? A circuit with low impedance, for example, is a loop. We have current and you have a small voltage. And what is a circuit with a high impedance? For example, it's a, consider a monopole. It's a circuit with a wire that is open at one end, at here, and then you are exciting with a voltage. This is a circuit where you will have in close to the circuit, basically electric field. So if you are measuring electric field, and at the same time that you are measuring electric and magnetic field, you go close to the source of the signal, you will see that the wave impedance at some distance start to decrease or the wave impedance start to increase. When the impedance increase, the impedance increase when the origin of the signal was at some kind of high impedance circuit like I am representing the high, this high impedance circuit with an open wire, monopole. And if you go down in uh, the wave impedance, it's because the origin of the signal was some kind of low impedance circuit, like for example, a loop. This is what I am trying to represent here. So what happens if you are measuring signals in your EMI debugging uh, uh, activities? You have three areas where you will be measuring. You will be measuring in the area number one. In this area is where we are in the far field. The area number two, this is what we call near field. And inside of the near field, we have the possibility to be interested in big electric field and a small magnetic fields, or big magnetic fields and a small electric fields. So we, you will need three different elements to do these measurements. The first element you need in the far field is one antenna. This is the area where we use antennas. This is the area in the near field. This is the area where we use near, near field electric probes. And this is the area where we use near field magnetic probes. So we need the three different, pro the, the three different uh, probes to make the measurements depending on the area where I am. The output of these probes, the antennas, near field electric probes or near field magnetic probes, probes can be connected to your instrument of interest. Some kind of, for example, a spectrum analyzer, some kind of oscilloscope, some kind of meter, EMI receiver, and you will see, you will be able to see the frequency or the time domain point of view of this signal. And where is the distance between the near and the far field that this is something that many people is interested in? If you try to go to electromagnetic theory, this is a no very easy task to calculate. But in EMI debugging, we consider that the distance where we can go from the near to the far field is basically lambda over six. So you need to calculate how much is the lambda, the size of your signal, to know what is the distance between the near and the far field. One example, if your frequency is 300 megahertz, you will see that lambda is 300 over 300 is, is equal to one meter. So lambda over six is equal to 100 centimeters divided by six. This is something like, I don't know, more or less 15 centimeters. If you are uh, uh, in the, close to the circuit at I don't know, five centimeters, you are in the, in the near field. If you are at one meter, you are in the far field. 
when we are measuring electromagnetic compatibility, typically we are measuring at, at a minimum frequency of 30 megahertz. And typically, the shortest distance is three meters. If you do this calculation, you will see that three meters for 30 megahertz is the far field. In the laboratory, in the semi echo chamber, you are always measuring in the far field. But if you are failing in the far field, it's because in the near field, you have this energy. And this energy is being radiated by your antenna. So it's very useful to go to the near field and to find what is the origin of this signal that is in the far field over some kind of limit. No? And this is what we try to do with near field systems. With near field systems, we will be interested in working in this area here to understand how is the circuit we are designing. So what is the near field probe? Very easy to understand. We need two different near field probes, electric and magnetic. Let me uh, prepare a homebrew near field probe. You take a piece of coax cable, you remove a small part of the shield, I don't know, five millimeters, three millimeters of the inner conductor out of the shield. This is a near field probe. You only need some kind of, I don't know, uh, um, uh, isolation material. This is typically around a probe. So if you are scanning around the circuit, you will not be creating some kind of source circuit. But in this small uh, element, you will be receiving the electric field lines that you have close to the point where you are locating the probe. This is a very small probe. You will be receiving a small quantity of electric field lines, and the output of this probe will be very small. But the advantage of this probe is that this probe is very good for a spatial resolution. You will be able to identify that the emissions came from one specific pin in one integrated circuit. If you are interested in scanning a big board and you want to find where is the area that is creating the problem, it's better to go to a bigger probe. Usually, a commercial bigger probe, the inner conductor here is, in, includes some kind of bowl or some kind of metal plate so you can pick up more electric field lines. And with these electric field lines, you are able to identify the area where the system is creating the energy. No? I mean, for example, you can use the big probe to scan the full PC board. You identify that the problem is on top of the DC-DC converter. And with a small probe, you can scan to find that the problem came from, on, is, is especially on top of the diode of the back converter. And this is a very, very effective uh, tool to find problems. In a, a magnetic field probe, what you need to create is a loop. So you take a piece of wire, and you connect the piece of wire directly to the shield. You are creating a source circuit. You are creating a loop. And then any kind of magnetic field line that goes from the environment is re received by this loop and is going to the output of the probe like a voltage that you see in the instrument. Remember, this kind of loop is sensitive basically to magnetic field because it's a low impedance system, but you can have some kind of uh, electric field sensitivity. That is because in commercial probes, sometimes this loop is prepared in this way. They make the loop, but then they extend the shield of the coax cable in this way. So this is the shield that is going around the inner conductor and then they create here a gap. Sometimes the gap, instead of being here, they sometimes they put the gap in the middle of the loop because in this way the probe is symmetrical. What is this? This is a magnetic field probe that is shielded for electric fields. So for many, many debugging applications, this kind of probe with the loop is very, very effective. But sometimes it's very useful to have this shielding effect. This is what you will find in commercial probes. I am using in this picture the probe, for example, for scanning a PCB. I can scan some kind of cable, the activity of a cable, or I can try to find in an enclosure if I have leakage around the cover or around some kind of connector. Many people know that the near field probes can be used for finding hot 
uh, areas in your design. But NISFIR probes are very useful too for immunity. In this immunity point of view, what you do is to inject signal in your NISFIR probe. So you inject signal from a signal generator with a small power amplifier, I don't know, one baht, two baht, three baht, you don't need a lot of power. You inject the signal in the probe, and then you will be exciting specific areas of your circuit. In this way, you can find what areas of your circuit are sensitive to some specific frequency and some specific modulation shape, okay? But we are interested here, basically, in emissions. What is a near-field scanner? Here, I have only one probe, one loop. Here, in one scanner, I have 1,200 small probes that they are in a flat surface. So you can put on top of the scanner your circuit, and these probes measure how are the emissions from the circuit switching the output of any of these probes very fast electronically. This is one of the possibilities. So in this way, what you have in your laboratory to be able to measure in this way, what you need is the surface with the probes. You need a spectrum analyzer, for example, typical spectrum analyzer from Rodensoir, from Keysight. These kind of uh, uh, good instruments are compatible with this kind of scanner. You need a software that is uh, offered by the manufacturer of the scanner and a small adapter uh, uh, unit, okay? Some models of scanners introduce a, a, a spectrum analyzer inside of the, uh, of the scanner, but at this moment, I am going to consider this idea. With this kind of scanners, we are able to scan, for example, between 50 kilohertz, no, I think this is wrong. I think it's around 100 kilohertz, up to eight gigahertz. We have here 1,200 small probes with a resolution that is around seven millimeters, five, seven millimeters. If you want the details of the product, please ask the, uh, Joram from uh, YIC because I am not uh, uh, expert in the details, okay? And uh, uh, the other possibility that you can work is with only one probe. The idea of this uh, scanner, that uh, you have uh, this idea uh, in the market, is uh, this kind of probe, one probe, that is in the arm of a robot. And then the robot can scan a PC board at different heights, you no? Know, instead of a, this flat surface, like I was explaining here, you no? Know. The disadvantage of this uh, system can be, for example, the, the speed, you no? Know. This is not a real uh, disadvantage for many, many of the debugging areas, like I will explain later, but this is the, the disadvantage compared with the flat uh, scanner. At the same time, the flat scanner is faster, you know, because the, the switch of position is electronic. And what can you do with this kind of scanners? Basically, you can do two things. The first thing you can do is one spectral scan. That means you are able to scan from one frequency to other frequency what signals are close to your circuit. This is one of the most important and interesting uh, uh, ideas to uh, receive from the, or information to receive from the scanner. The other important thing you can do uh, with this kind of a scanner is one spatial scan. For these frequencies, or for any specific frequency, you can create this kind of plots where you are able to identify that specific frequency that is of interest for you, that is of interest for you where it is located in your layout, where it is located in your cables, where it is located in your enclosure. And then you can apply fixes, capacitors, ferrites, some change in the software, and then you will be able to uh, try to solve the problem. Then uh, the, the main advantages of this kind of analysis that you are able to identify, for example, critical loops, you can find the source of emissions, or for example, you can understand why the product is failing. This is very important to avoid the trial and error process that many times we use when debugging an EMI problem. We can learn for the future. And you can do this, for example, for layouts in PCBs, cables, and buildings. This is a very, very uh, useful tool. And I like a lot, especially when I am teaching, because is the, when you can see things, it's, very, it's easier to understand. Oh, this is a sentence that I explained to my students many times. If you can see it, 
you can fix it. Okay, so this is what I am going to do in this uh, um, uh, webinar, is uh, to show you with some examples how these uh, instruments can work. So let me disconnect this screen. So now I'm going to go back to uh, this area. Now this is the This is my camera. I hope you, if not, let me know, Joram. I suppose now you are looking at a green uh, uh, area in the screen with my hand. And then yeah. we, we can see here the first idea. The first idea is to explain the NIFIR probe. This is a commercial NIFIR probe. You can see that this is a small loop here. Or, for example, you can find this kind of kits. You can open the kit and you will find different probes. One probe can be bigger or can be smaller. And you can find that these probes are for, for example, in this uh, case is for H field loop is from 0.3 to 100 megahertz. Or for example, the other probe is an electrical electric near field probe that goes from 30, 20 megahertz up to one gigahertz. No? So usually what we have in our laboratory is some kind of kit of probes. This is another typical kit that you can use for debugging. Okay, like this one, you have several probes and you connect these probes with a coax cable to your instrument. This is what I am going to do in my first example. In my first example, let me show you the PC board I will be using. Is this one? This is a small PC board where you can see I have displays, I have a microcontroller, I have several drivers for the LEDs, I have a real time clock, I have a crystal for the microcontroller several keys, I have, a, I don't know, different elements. In a two layers board, this is the top layer, and this is the, uh, the bottom layer, okay, the second layer. There is no ground plane. This is a layout that is done with a, it's with a system that is working without problems. And I am powering the system from these two points from five volts. So I am going to apply here five volts. Let's take the circuit here this way. Let's take the voltage in this way. Okay. And let me switch on my power supply uh, here. Okay. Yep. Okay. The system now is working. I can touch the keys. And then consider I am interested in measuring how are the emissions. No? But I am going to measure the emissions. Let me try to use the, the other camera is to show you the screen of my instrument, no? So this is the instrument I am going to use. So I'm going to take the oscilloscope and I'm going to connect the near field probe to channel number one. So you will see in the screen of your computer this, uh, this uh, screen of the instrument in a better way, no? This is the screen of my scope. And let me connect the near field probe to the scope, no? Let me try to do this for you so you can see both things at the same time. Let me reduce the size of this. Let me reduce the size of this. Okay, this way. And this is the screen of the scope, no? So when I connect with a coax cable, let me connect to channel number one. And let me connect in this way with the adapter. I have an adapter here. I connect an e-field probe. Then when I go close to the circuit, I am able to identify where I have activity. Remember that in a PCB, currents are in some kind of uh, horizontal plane. So the magnetic field, let me change the, the size of the system this way. Okay, so if currents are horizontal in the PCB, the magnetic field is going vertical. So if you put the probe vertical, you will not be able to pick up as much energy like if you put the probe uh, horizontal, no? So for example, when I go in this area, I detect more energy. When I go here, I detect more energy. When I get, I'm on top of the microcontroller, I have more energy. Obviously, this is the time domain uh, signal, no? Of course, in EMI, many times, additionally to the time domain signal, it's very useful to see the frequency domain, no? This is the energy I am taking from the probe, let me take the FFT 
up to, for example, 500 megahertz. And let me change the resolution bandwidth to 100 kilohertz. And then you can see that I can identify exactly when I am far from the circuit, then when I go here, I can identify the areas where I have more or less energy. You can go to find specifically some signal, and then you can do some kind of changes in your circuit or in your software to reduce or to kill some specific frequency. So this is only to introduce you the idea of a near-field probe. I use near-field probes every day in many, many of my analyses. But let's go to the idea of using one scanner, OK? So instead of scanning the board in this way, I'm going to switch to another camera, OK? So you can see here this camera. Let me switch on some lights so perhaps you can see better the surface, OK? And let me put the, pro, the scanner, the, the PCB, on top of the scanner. Look at this. I am going to put in this way, I'm going to put here the PCB, OK? The, the, the PCB is more or less uh, fixed because I use this kind of uh, blue tack uh, uh, elements, you know? They are very, very handy, very useful to be able to put uh, on top of the scanner. So I am going to put here the PCB, and I'm going to put here the uh, power supply cable, no? Then I will be, I am able to open, let me see, I, okay, compartir, right, I am sharing this screen. I don't know why. I want to share. Now I'm going to change here. And now let me, uh, let me open the software. Joram, in theory, now we are uh, with the software of EMViewer on. So I hope all of you see the software. OK, let me see. Here it is. Here, OK. OK. This way. You see the software? Joram? Please? Yeah, yeah. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. It's only to avoid uh, problems. OK, so let me switch the, the orientation of the camera so you can see the PCB like I see the, the, the board. And let me uh, explain how we work with this. First, I'm going to create, this is the software of the instrument. I can select uh, any of both uh, scanners. You go here. I can select the EM probe or I can select the EM scanner. The EM scanner is the surface. So let me set the scanner. And then you need to connect the radio frequency output of the scanner to the spectrum analyzer. Let me check that it's connected. Correct. And then when you have connected the EM scanner to the Spectrum analyzer, you can create some kind of specific nodes. You can create a spectral, a spectral spatial, a spectral uh, comparison, a spatial analysis. Let me go to a spectral. And in a spectral, the software gives you the possibility to specify what kind of frequency range. For example, let me consider I am interested in the range from one, 10 to 120 megahertz. Let me put a resolution bandwidth in 120 kilohertz. Let me establish measure peaks. Measure peaks is that I am going to select the uh, four of the biggest peaks in my analysis. And for intermittent signals, sometimes it's useful to specify the peak hold, uh, uh, this square. If you select this square, uh, then for random signals, when you are doing a continuous scan, you will be able to pick up this kind of uh, non-continuous uh, or intermittent signals. No? Then I select the probes in the scanner that are of interest for me. For example, let me select known now. So uh, my, my uh, product is now in this area of the PCB. No? If, you, if I change the, the camera, you will be able to see that basically, oh, sorry, I have that the color. OK. Now and now. OK. Now you can see, basically, that the, the, the circuit is between the columns P to AF and from 6 to 16. So you go to, from P to AF and from 6 to 16, and you select cells. 
This is very useful because in this way, you are not scanning the full area because I am only interested in this area. For a spectral scan, it's not necessary to select all these areas. I can select better some of the points that are in this area because then the scanner will be faster, the scan will be faster, and I will be able to pick up the energy in the same way. So I'm not going to change other of the uh, possibilities of the system. And then the first thing to do is to make a measurement that is with the device under test off. So I'm going to power off my circuit. The circuit is now uh, without power supply. And then I run the scan. When I run the scan, the software uh, configure the spectrum analyzer, make the scanning of the PC board, and then I will obtain here the, uh, the results of the scanning. No? You can see that from 10 megahertz to 120 megahertz, I have only activity in this area, that is the area of FM broadcasting, with this kind of levels. No? Later we will see what these kind of levels are. Obviously, if you make these measurements in some kind of a shielded structure, you will have uh, more possibilities to reduce this uh, noise from the environment. And look at this, the system is measuring the biggest uh, peaks, no? four in this case. No? Now, let me switch on my device. I switch on the device, okay? I can uh, put some numbers. Later, the numbers will disappear because in the software is specified in this way. I am going to repeat the scanning, no? So I can do an one, only, one scan or I can scan continuously. Later, we will do the continuous scan, no? So you, you can see here the difference, no? This is with the device under test off. This is with the device under test on. Obviously, I can use the same scale, no? So let's see how is the scale for the situation with the uh, switch on. This outer scale is going from minus, for example, minus three. Sorry, minus three to, for example, 19. This is the scale for the device on, minus three to 19. So I go to the other measurement, and I'm going to specify the same scale, no? Minus three to minus 19. In this way, it's very easy to compare how is the difference between one and the other. I can create some specific node that is called the spectral comparison. In the spectral comparison, I have another net that is waiting for the specification of the measurement, some kind of reference, and then we, I will be able to, co to see the comparison. No? For example, as the reference, let me select from my spectral analysis the noise in the environment. So I put it here. This is the noise from the environment. Now, from the test point of view, I am going to select the device under test on. So this is the device under test on. This is the no ambient noise. This is the comparison. So you can see that specifically these frequencies are created by my circuit. You can see that I have some specific frequency. For example, I am interested in this or, or I am interested in this. If you go to the, the previous, let me close the comparison, you can see that I have here one peak, the second peak, the third peak, the uh, last peak here. This is the biggest peaks in my circuit. No? The idea is, for example, if you are interested in this peak, where is this peak in your circuit? Eh? This peak is around uh, 11.06 megahertz, 11.06 megahertz. So let's go to a spectral scan and let's go to the add node option and then a spatial option. What is this? This is an, I, I am able to do now a spatial scan, but based in the previous spectral scan. So I am able to specify at what frequency I want a special scan, but or I can go to the peak marker list where I have the frequencies that have been measured by the system. No? In this case, for example, the 11.06 megahertz. I am going to use the 120 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, and let's go to the spatial scan probes. Now it's different, because I am not interested what frequencies I have in this area, with some specific amplitude, but I am interested in where is specifically in my PCB. So really, I need to select all the cells in my scanner. Then I can uh, make, uh, put 
The other options of the software by default is not a problem now for my demo. So I can go here and you can see what happens if I make a run of the scan. Okay. So I go to the setting of the spectrum analyzer. Now we, we do the scanning. Okay, the scan is complete. So you can see here that I have here how is the activity in my PCB. I can make a zoom here, so it's easier for me to understand. No? So if you move the pointer, you will see that with a mouse, the pointer is only specifying that the frequency is 111.06 megahertz. Why? Because this is the frequency I am interested in. Uh, later, I will show you that you can do an spectral spatial scan, and this is very useful to identify several frequencies in a full system. No? The idea is, but this area, where is the area? Is, is, if I see here the, 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 the PCB, it's clear that the area is around the, the microcontroller, and it's around this area, and it's going in this area, going in this area, but you can see that this color is yellow, so I have some kind of activity in this area. So that is because in this PCB, this line that you see here is basically the ground. The ground is not in a ground plane. The ground are traces that are far from the uh, forward uh, lines. So we are creating big loops. So let me see if I am able to locate exactly where is the activity. I can go here and I can edit the overlay. What means the overlay? I can uh, import here some kind of, for example, picture. Let's go, no, some kind of Gerber file. Let me see where is the, the um, where is the, uh, uh, here, the overlays. And let me go to the overlay of my, uh, the Gerber file, sorry, here. It's, the, it's a file that is the silk screen of the design. So I can rotate. Uh, clockwise, and then let me mirror vertically, and then I can put, no, sorry, is uh, rotate clockwise, clockwise, now it's correct, so I can put the silk screen here, okay, apply, and okay, so now it's easier, Up. sorry, now it's easier for me to see exactly, okay, to see exactly where is the activity? You can see that here is the microcontroller. The activity goes from the BCC pin to the ground pin. This, this is a microcontroller from Philips. And the BCC pin is this pin, and the ground pin is this one. So it's going, the activity is going in this direction, and it's creating this loop in this area. But obviously, I have some kind of retro current in this way at 11.6 megahertz. Why is this? Let me show you the camera. Okay, if, you, if we go with the camera to make a zoom, if we make a zoom with the camera, okay, not easy to do, let me go here. If we go close to the circuit, okay, you will see the, the crystal here, okay. The crystal here, is 11.0592 megahertz. So this is obviously is a very simple example and it's very easy to, to know for people with experience in electronics that when you see these harmonics, these harmonics are created by, they are related with the, with the clock of the digital system you are analyzing. So really what I have here is a big loop, no? Let me show you what happened if I introduce in this circuit, let me open here, where is the, the circuit here, ah, uh, here. Where is, where is, where is, it's up here. Where is the, where is the special scan? What happened here? Where is, I have a, a move the, where is the, the image? Sorry, I don't see where is, where, where is? What a screen. I have several screens in my computer where I don't know where is the screen. Okay. Let me open here. It's here. Here. And this is disappearing. I don't know why. Oh, let me scan again. Okay. Ah, it's here. Ah, no, no, it's here. 
No, I don't see where is the, the screen, sorry. Okay, so let's go here. It's disappeared. Ah, now, here, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now this is the previous one. Okay, was hiding. My, my screen was minimized, no? So let me see, this is the, the, let me remove the last one. And now you can see that this is the result. But now this circuit, the decoupling capacitor is here. The decoupling capacitor is close to the pin, ground pin, and it's not close, it's not in with a very small loop, no? So let me introduce now how is the uh, effect of this uh, decoupling capacitor, no? So let me introduce the decoupling capacitor. It's a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Okay, so you can see in the camera how I am introducing the decoupling capacitor. Okay, this way. Yes, this is the, the capacitor I am introducing. Let me run again. Okay. Let me run again. There, you can see, okay. And let me uh, edit the overlay again. Let me mirror vertically and let me rotate clockwise. Now, let me put here, so apply, okay. So you, we can see the difference. So to see the difference, I need, to, I need to use the same scale. So let me go here, let me go here, and let me see what scale I am using in the first result without the decoupling capacitor. Let me put here minus three, minus three to 31, minus three to 31. And I go to the second measurement, and let me put here minus three to 31. If not, you, if we have selected the auto scale, uh, we will not be able to identify clearly the difference, no? You can see this is without the decoupling capacitor. This is without the decoupling capacitor, and this is with the decoupling capacitor. We can see automatically how is the difference between them, no? Let me consider what happened if I uh, add some additional element in my design. Consider, for example, that my PCB is powered with a DC-DC converter, not a linear power supply. I'm going to change my power supply with a DC-DC converter. Let me change this one. <clears throat> so you can see here. Okay, this way. Okay. And this is my small DC-DC converter. I have really here two DC-DC converters. One is a 12 volts and the other is a five volts DC-DC converter. I remove from here the five volts uh, uh, cable and let me replace with a shorter cable, this one. Let me introduce in the board now. And now I am going to take the output from the back converter. No? So the idea this is consider that, for example, this is your design. You have a big PC board or you have several PC boards. This is the power supply board. This is the microcontroller board. And there is a small uh, cable that is connecting with the power supply. No? Let me put the cable exactly on top of, the, um, of this uh, orange line of uh, cells. So it's easier to identify. And this is the DC-DC converter. No? Now the DC-DC converter will take from my power supply a nine volts voltage that is going to the pins of the DC board. Okay, this pin and this pin, no? Now this is nine volts. This is the back converter with the inductor of the back converter. This is the cable carrying five volts that goes to the microcontroller board. No? Obviously to make a scan of this system, I need to do some kind of uh, additional uh, uh, set up, no? I need to change the probes. Let me make a note that is different. Let me make an, a spectral spatial analysis, no? And in the spectral spatial analysis, I select the, the frequency range again, for example, 100 to 120 megahertz, 120 kilohertz. Let me not select the measure of peaks, so in this way, uh, the scan is faster. We select the spectral spatial scans known here let me scan in this area, more or less. And now I need to introduce the area that is close to 10 to this area here. And let me scan the area where we have the cable. Okay, this is 
the spectral spatial scans. Ah, no, 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 sorry, sorry. In the spectral spatial scans, I need to specify all the uh, probes for both analyses, sorry. There is no one spectral, one spatial, it's both of them. So I need to make this analysis for these probes, select, then I need to specify from 10 to, for example, uh, uh, the 19, and this one, 19, 20, this is the area where I have the dc, -DC converter, and this is the area where, sorry, this is the area where I have the cable, more or less, okay? Okay, so this is the cable, this is the dc, -DC converter, and this is the power supply, no? And let me introduce some kind of overlay. In the overlay, instead of this one, let me import a picture. You can import a picture of the PCB or of the PCBs, no? So I can put here the PCB and I can adjust as best as possible. Obviously, I have prepared these pictures, so, but it's not very difficult, no? But in this way, we don't need a lot of time to prepare the setup for the demo, for the webinar. Okay, more or less is, is the area. Oh, I need to move. I need to move the, my scan, uh, my my PC board. Okay, sorry. Let's go to this. It's 11. Uh, this way from here. Okay, and then we need to put this. Okay, this way. And I'm scanning this area. Okay, so in theory, now it's better. No, 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 no. See, yes, yes, now it's correct, no? Now I have, ah, no, no, in the picture, this pack converter is exactly on top of the orange color, no? So this is the cells here. You can see that the cells, the orange, the orange uh, uh, row is on top of the uh, uh, back converter PC board. That is the same here, no? So this is okay. And then here, I need to remove these lines here and select, not necessary really, but in this way, perhaps we will have a faster scan, no? So I have here the picture, accept, and then I can run the analysis. So now the system will be scanning for the full number of cells in the full frequency range. In this case, from 10 megahertz to uh, 120 megahertz with a 125 kilohertz bandwidth. You can see how the scanner is doing the scan. Perhaps uh, the picture will not be exactly in the millimeter with the position of the components, but it's uh, enough to demonstrate the utility of this. Okay, so you can see that the scanner is not is doing a big scan. Okay. You can see that uh, close to the cable, we start to be activity, to have activity. Why? Because in the cable, we have energy that is going, uh, especially in common mode. We have two wires. The activity in differential mode is not creating big activity uh, in the environment because the cancellation effect, no, there is no loop but the noise that is coming from the DC-DC converter that is injected or is exciting the cable in common mode is one of the most typical uh, problems that I have found in commercial products when failing in radiated emissions. No? We are close to the finish. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I go and fast, so we are on time. So. We have here the result. We can see that nothing happens. Okay, this is the environment, sorry. Let me switch on the power supply. <laughs> Let me switch on now the power supply. So wait, wait a Oops. Oops. Uh, here, let me switch run again because the power supply was off, sorry. System is scanning again. Okay. We can uh, create additionally to this kind of uh, no nodes, spectral, spatial, spectral, spatial, 
we can compare spectral analysis and we can compare spatial analysis to make measurements in both uh, domains. Okay. Now we can start to see more activity, obviously. We can see the harmonics. This is the, the harmonics that are coming from the microcontroller system. And we start to see the broadband activity that is coming from the DC-DC converter. No? Remember that from the, the DC-DC converter is switching, I don't know, at 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz. But it's, a very typic, it's very typical to obtain from this kind of converters EMI that can create failures in radiated emissions between 50, kilo, 50 megahertz up to 200 megahertz, for example. This activity is coming typically from ringing in the switching activity of the transistor or the diode or from some kind of parasitic oscillation that you have created in the layout of your PCB. This kind of uh, analysis is very useful to identify exactly where you have these uh, problems. No? So now we are finishing here the scan of the PC board, the main PC board, and now we are going to finish the DC-DC converter. Let's make a zoom of the system. Okay, it's finished. We are going to make a zoom here. We can remove the picture. So you can see that now we have all the activity in the PCB, and when I move the mouse around the system, both uh, amplitude and frequency change. So look at this, this is a green color, but if I am with the mouse on top of the green color, I can identify that some frequencies are 11 megahertz, other frequencies are 33, and some frequencies are 55, because it's the first, the third, and the fifth harmonic of the clock in this PCB. But look at this, in this area I have frequencies that are in 120, 116 megahertz that are coming from this area. In this area, the frequencies, the biggest activity is around 120 megahertz. This area is this, the area that is related with the back converter. And you can see exactly, the, uh, this is the device and the diode that they are switching to go from the nine input volts to the five volts in the power supply. And you can identify that in this area, in this area here, let me remove the picture, I have green color. That means that in the cable, I have activity. If this cable is carrying 120 megahertz and this cable is long enough, you can radiate with the cable to the environment, no? In this radiation is coming from noise that is circulating in common mode, no? Let me see, show you how is the activity in 3D. If we go to 3D, we can move this activity and we can go in and out in the emissions so you can see that the peak of the emissions, this peak of emissions is coming from the back converter here, okay? And especially in the area where I have the main device, no? It's very useful to identify, for example, how is the effect of a ferrite, no? For example, one possibility to minimize the emissions from this cable, the best option obviously is to kill the ringing here, no? If we go to the... Uh, a scope screen and I connect to the BCDC converter, I connect my probe from the, let me switch, show you, okay. What I am measuring now with a big, uh, the, obviously this is a big pigtail, but don't worry about this pigtail because the ringing in the transistor is exactly the same without the pigtail, no? Because I have uh, done it previously. So let me uh, show you how is the activity in the time domain in the switching activity of my device, okay? You can see here this, the switching waveform in the transistor, and you can see this ringing. This ringing in the device is the ringing that is creating the problems uh, the, the emissions uh, at uh, BHF and UHF uh, ranges. No? Typically, the solution is to introduce here some kind of a snubber, so the signal is going in this direction, goes up, but this over, uh, under damped situation goes to a over damped situation without the ringing. This is the best solution, but sometimes we don't have the, this possibility. And one solution, a typical solution in many a product is to introduce some kind of ferrite, no? So you go to the catalog of ferrite and you select the ferrite that introduce impedance, sorry, you select 
FRI that introduce impedance in the frequency range of interest. So let me scan the board, same board with the FRI in, pla in place. No? Now I'm going to scan again. And we will be able to change the scales in the idea that we can compare what happened with or without FRI. These some patients. Okay. So while the system is scanning, remember that the idea that the idea of this um, ferrite is this one. Okay. Okay. So we have a system like this. We have another system. Do have the two wires, and the noise is going in common mode. This is what we call common mode. No? This noise for us is a frequency of around 120 megahertz. So the idea is that we go to the manufacturer of the ferrite and is offering one ferrite that is in this way. No? So this is the frequency that is of interest for me. Okay? I go to a, for a ferrite. This is another ferrite for the manufacturer. This is another ferrite for the manufacturer. I am interested in this ferrite. Why? Because this ferrite is offering the peak of impedance at the frequency I want to kill. This, this impedance is, for example, something like 600 ohms. That means that you are introducing here and you are introducing here 600 ohms, but only for the common mode. Eh? If you look at this impedance, this impedance has two parts. The first part is the part of resistive effect. The resistive effect of this ferrite is doing something like this. And the other effect that I am going to plot in pink is this effect that is inductive effect, no? So this is what we call X, reactive effect. And this is what we call resistive effect, okay? So the impedance is the resistive plus the reactive effect. When we are using ferrite for this application, we want to use the resistive part of the ferrite so the noise is attenuated, okay? It's not reflected. We don't want reflection. We want to dissipate the noise in the ferrite, so the noise uh, fully disappear. So the scanner is finished, this is the result, and to be able to compare both uh, results, it's very useful to change the scale, no? So this is the previous measurement. Let me see, let me change the, sorry, let me close this. This is the scan now with the ferrite. This is, this is with the ferrite, this is without the ferrite, no? So without the ferrite, let me remove the picture. Okay, let me remove the overlay. And this is with the ferrite, remove the overlay, okay? And here too. And then let me go to the scale. This is without the ferrite. Let me put here from 0 0.5 to 42, for example. From 0 0.5 to 42. And now with the ferrite, we will go from 0.5 to 42, the same scale. I'm sorry, 42. Okay, so this is without the ferrite, and this is with the ferrite. Without the ferrite, and with the ferrite. You can see that in this area, in the cable, there is no energy going because the effect of the ferrite. Obviously, in this area, the 11 megahertz, 33 megahertz, 50 megahertz is not changed because this is the activity of the digital circuit. And the activity in the buck converter is in the same way, because there is no change here. I have not changed the, 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 the design, so I have the energy here. So if, for example, you have another cable, you have the opportunity to radiate with the other cable. No? Well, um, this is what I have been trying to show with the EM scanner. So let me go to the EM probe. What happened with the EM probe? The EM probe is useful. First, I am going to change, let me go here. Let me save this in the uh, disk. Let me say name one. And let me uh, open another file that is uh, called for example, this one, this one, okay, this one. And let me change to the new scanner, no? So now I have selected the EM scanner. I'm going to select the EM probe, okay? And let me show you with the camera 
where is the the application of the camera okay let me see where is the camera like here okay Okay, so this is the the camera, the other camera, and I'm going to show you the area I am going to scan. Okay, this way. Okay, let me make a shoe. This is a, a TV. It's a digital TV. You can see here. You can see here that I have a full product. I have a power supply here. You can see the power supply here. And I have the area where I have digital circuits, where I have radio frequency circuits, where I have connectors, cables. This kind of system is um, more difficult to scan than a PCB because it's not flat, no? So the idea is to use this uh, robot, the M-probe is a product where instead of using several probes in a surface, I am using the arm of a robot where I introduce my NIFIL probe. So let's take the NIFIL probe, I take this accessory to introduce the probe in the scanner, okay, this way. And I connect the output of the probe so the uh, radio frequency can go to the uh, scanner, to, sorry, to the spectrum analyzer. Now, here, I am going to do an spectral spatial scan, no? The first thing to do is to establish the frequency range, for example, one megahertz to 80 megahertz in 120 kilohertz bandwidth, resolution bandwidth in the spectrum analyzer. Uh, I am not going to measure peaks in this uh, example. If you are interested, we can do it later. And let me show you how is the area I am going to scan. I am going to scan in the camera. I'm going to scan this area. Eh? Let me show you with, some, with more detail, okay? So you can see that this is the area where we have the radio frequency, no? In this area where I have the radio frequency, I'm going to demonstrate how I can use the EM probe to test how effective is the shielding of this area, okay? So let's go here. Let's put the camera in this position. So let me, let's make an auto zoom so you can see the camera, the, the probe moving. And then in the settings of the scanner, what you do is to put some kind of overlay. Okay? I have used this overlay, it's a picture of this area of the system. And then uh, the probe is in this position actually, but uh, I am going to go from here to here, from here to here following these uh, selected uh, probes. And then I can select the height I want in the probe, no? In uh, why I uh, see technologies is developing now a new product, and they will explain you uh, that in the future the H of the probe will be uh, um, with different H for different probes. But now this is the way to to work. So let's make accept, okay, and then make room room. Uh, let me show you the picture, the camera. I hope not to have problems because the problem with uh, this kind of real demos is that sometimes you can have problems. <laughs> Things work easier with uh, software. <laughs> so you can see that the probe is scanning. Okay, system is scanning here. The result is in the screen of the EM viewer, the software, and you can see here how the probe is moving. Okay. You can uh, sweep in its, some specific frequency range or you can uh, okay. the uh, scan is finished. So you can see here the result. Okay. This is like previously. You can view the system in, in 3D. You can identify the areas where you have more activity, or you can see, removing the picture, in what areas you have more energy, no? Now, I can introduce the silt, no? So 
So let's let's go to introduce the shield. You can compare different materials. You can compare different designs. The effect of some specific uh, leak um, slot or aperture in the design, and you can start again here the scan. No, the scan again. And we will obtain a second measurement. Okay. Sometimes you are worried about uh, plastic cover that is has been uh, painted with metallic paint, or sometimes you are using some kind of ferrite plate, no, like uh, the ferrite plates that uh, are typical from Booth Electronics, or you are interested in two different. Uh, materials to different dimensions in materials. So you can compare with numbers the final product of some specific prototype that is useful to make these measurements. So now we are going to finish. Obviously to scan these kind of systems is uh, more difficult than with a flat scanner, but the advantage is that the software can work with both of them at the same time. No, this is one, and this is the second one. Let me remove the overlay again. And let me put the same scale. No, in this uh, system, the scale is uh, between 1.9 and let me put here 5.5, 5.5 and 2. So it's easier to remember from 2 to 5.5. Here in the second, I go from 2 to 5.5. Okay. So this is the difference. No, I don't know why. Something is wrong. Something is wrong, or I have not connected because typically the result of this. Let me show you one previous example, like this one. Okay, this one, this one. No, this one. This is the result, but typically is is what happened. Ah, I know what happened. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> the the TV is off. <laughs> Sorry, let me switch on the TV. This is signals only from the environment. So I'm going to switch on the TV. Okay, sorry, sorry. But I, I'm going to do this fast. Let me remove this measurement so we, we cannot have confusion. Let me run again. Oh, sorry, this is not this from this. Run again. I'm going to run again the system. This is the last uh, measurement I am going to do before going to the questions uh, time. And of course, if in the questions time you want some kind of a specific measurement, we can repeat, but we are close to the one hour and 30 minutes that we have uh, planned for the event. So you will be able to go for lunch or with your family. Let me spend a couple of minutes. This is the situation where I am measuring with the EM probe, remember, and with the metallic cover on top. This is the opposite in the previous trial. Okay, now is with the cover. And let me now remove the cover. And now I'm going to repeat the measurement. Okay, sometimes these kind of measurements fail because it's not easy to to have problems in demos. But I think we today we have we are lucky. There is no failures with cameras or microphone or with the scanners. So let's one of the most uh, useful um, appliance of these uh, uh, scanners is when you need to find where is a frequency that is not part of your design, no? Because if the frequency where you are failing is harmonics of your clock or the frequency where you have an oscillator, it's not difficult to understand where is the origin. Not easy, but it's not uh, very, very difficult. The problem is when the emissions came from some kind of uh, ringing or from some kind of parasitic oscillation because of the layout of your product. This is the system without, with the sealed. This is without the, uh, without the sealed. So let me see the scale. In the scale I key, here, I go, I'm going to go from 2 to 5.5. 5.5, this is the idea. We can see that the areas where I have more activity are in these points. 
is from 2 to 5.5, and here is there is no big difference. I don't know why. Oops. There is no big difference. Something is going. Ah, no, I have removed it. This is without, and this is with. But there is no the 70 megahertz. No, I don't know. Something is wrong with the circuit, because this circuit, this circuit has a strong emission around 70 megahertz, and I see that this emission is not here. Both emissions look like ambient uh, emissions. And in my previous, uh, when I was preparing this demo, in this circuit, there is a strong signal in 70 megahertz that I see now that is not here. Okay, So something is wrong with my circuit. Sorry. Sorry, but I think we are on time. And uh, I prefer to go to the question and answers. And if someone of you are interested, we can continue later and i repeat again the measurement so i avoid delay for the people that is not interested specifically in this part uh, so joram you want we can start with the questions uh, yes thank you art uh, just my input did you connected the EMP? oh no 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 it's true it's true this is the this is the question the question is that i didn't connect the radio frequency output of the em probe to the uh, spectrum analyzer oh yeah so it's oh not, uh, sorry not sorry okay. sorry well, this is i a... think it's, it's okay because i think uh, we are uh, on time so i don't know if we have time to to do this okay. again Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, one. We, now we can actually accept the uh, questions. If, if yes, I, I'm going to put the system running uh, with without the sealed. Then we can start to answer questions, and uh, I will be doing the test while I am uh, answering. Okay. If you want, no. Now the the TV is on. The robot is on, and the robot is connected to the spectrum analyzer. So I hope <laughs> that I don't forget nothing. Eh? In, when I was preparing this experiment in this area, there is a strong peak of 70 megahertz. You can see here the activity I was explaining. No, Here you can see that around 70 megahertz, there is a strong activity. You can see the peak I was explaining before. Okay, And it's specifically in this, in this area of the circuit. So this is the result. Okay. It's finished. It. Now let me go to the circuit and I will introduce the silt. Where is the silt? It's here. So let's go here. Okay, and then we'll repeat the test. It's not very big here. You can see that in this area there is uh, some activity. Part of this activity is from the environment, and you can see the the big peak of 70 megahertz. Obviously, we are in the near field because at 70 megahertz, that is close to 100 megahertz, uh, the distance between the near and the far field is not so so close to the circuit. We are finishing. Okay, and now I'm going to repeat my previous work changing the scale, no? It's finished. So now I am here. This is without the seal. You can see the big peak at 70 megahertz. Let's go to the scale. In auto scale, let's put here 17 to 40. That is easier to remember. 17 to 40. And this is the sum of the PC board. And this is the auto scale, 17 to 40. Is we see, yeah, we see that there is Okay, so this is without the seal, and this is with the seal. Without the seal, and with the seal. And if we are doing this kind of a spectral spatial scan, obviously we can activate the uh, overlay to identify exactly where is the, the, the problem, no? The specific area where we have the, the problem. Okay. 
and the overlay is here. Okay, okay, okay. So we can remove or we can put where it's exactly, and here is the same. We see that the uh, 70 megahertz is around this area here. You know? And uh, the other possibility is to go to the user composite view, and when we click here, the system says that in this point, in this cell, the energy is here. But if you go here, there is no 70 megahertz signal. If you go here, you have 70 megahertz signal. So this is the area where I have this specific energy that is going from one side to the other side. Okay, so that's all. I think we have we were able to review near field probes, scanners, flat scanners, and the EM probe. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Art. I'm so glad you did that, um, Thank you. that presentation for us. Um, we can open up now for any questions. If you've got any questions to ask um, Arturo, um, you can put them in the chat box um, or you can just ask out loud. So if there's any questions at this stage. No questions? Okay, so if you do have any questions um, and you don't want to ask it here, um, you can either email us at um, support at yictechnologies.com and we will do uh, send it to Arturo um, so that he can uh, answer if, if we're not able to answer. Or, uh, Professor, if you just want to put your email down there um, so people can have a look and if they want to email you directly. Did you put your email down? No questions? Okay, thank you very much. We'll end the day. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much to all the people attending. Thank you, Cornell. Thank you, Yoram. Thank you. Bye-bye.